Who Was William Shakespeare? By Celeste Davidson Manis, illustrated by John O'Brien. Who Was William Shakespeare? William Shakespeare you probably know his name even if you haven't read anything by him yet. He lived 450 years ago, wrote at least 35 plays, and more than 150 poems. Many people think Shakespeare is the greatest playwright who ever lived. Everything Shakespeare wrote has been translated into dozens of languages, from Spanish to Japanese to Swahili. People all over the world still watch performances of his plays. Movies and Broadway musicals have been based on many of them, such as Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, and Hamlet. Hundreds of words and phrases we use every day were invented by him words like cold-blooded, quarrelsome, and love letter. His language, ideas, and stories are all around us. Although William Shakespeare is very famous, we don't know a lot about him. Much of his personal life remains a mystery. Back in the 1500s, not many records were kept for the average person. We know Shakespeare began his life as the son of a glovemaker in the small town of Stratford-upon-Avon. He ended it as a rich and famous London playwright. But what happened in between? We know when he married and when he had children. We know he didn't live with his family for many years. Instead, he went to London, where he became an actor, playwright, and a director of plays. He built and bought theaters. He wrote and acted in plays for the Queen of England. He made friends with powerful noblemen. But what about Shakespeare's day-to-day -day life? What kind of man and father was he? What made him write plays? Chapter 1 Little Will Baby Will was baptized in Stratford's Holy Trinity Church in 1564. The exact date of his birth is unknown, but it is celebrated on April 23rd. In England, that day is also a holiday, filled with play-acting and parties. It seems a good day to honor England's greatest playwright as well. The Shakespeare family lived in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, about 100 miles northwest of London. No more than 2,500 people lived there. When Will was just a few months old, a horrible illness swept through the country. It was called the Black Death, or Bubonic Plague. Over 200 people in Stratford died. The very old and very young were hardest hit. Luckily, John and Mary Shakespeare survived. And so did their firstborn son. Will's father made gloves, belts, purses, and aprons. Will's mother came from a family who owned farmland. She could trace her family back more than 500 years. The Shakespeare's belonged to England's middle class. They weren't rich, nor were they part of the nobility. But they lived well. During the 1560s, English families like the Shakespeare's had food on the table, a roof over their heads, and steady work. It was enough. By the time Will was born, Elizabeth I had been queen for six years. She was 31 years old. She had no interest in war. Under good Queen Bess, as she was called, England grew more and more prosperous. It was also a time of discovery and new ideas. In 1519, Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese explorer, set out to sail all the way around the world. The trip took three years. It had never been done before. In 1514, Nicolaus Copernicus, a Polish astronomer, first wrote that the sun was the center of the universe. Before that, people believed the Earth was the center with the sun and other planets circling around it. Artists throughout Europe, especially in Italy, were creating some of the most beautiful paintings and sculptures the world has ever known. The printing press, invented in the 1400s, made many more books available. Before that time, books had to be copied by hand. More and more people learned to read and write. This was the world that William Shakespeare was born into. Stratford was a bustling market town on the banks of the Avon River. Crowds came on market day or passed through town on their way to London. 
What could a person buy? Almost anything, from pigs and sheep to pretty ribbons, warm woolen clothing, and soft doeskin gloves. The job of the town council was to keep law and order. John Shakespeare was a member of the town council for many years. When Will was four years old, his father served as high bailiff for a year. It was like being mayor. The position was one of great honor. As a young boy, Will learned a great deal from plays, poetry, and folk tales. They were written and performed by ordinary people on the streets of Stratford stories about love and great events in history. Nearby was a town called Coventry. It was famous for mystery plays. These plays were about stories from the Bible. Stages were set up on wagons. A different scene from the mystery play was performed on each wagon as they rolled through town. People came to Coventry from all over to watch. Perhaps little will travel there to see them. Sometimes professional actors came to Stratford. When Will was four years old, a group called the Queen's Men visited. The people of Stratford crowded into the town hall. There they watched the troop try out in front of the town council. Will's father liked the actors. As high bailiff, he gave them permission to perform in town. He paid them nine shillings about fifty dollars from the Stratford treasury to put on a show. That was a lot of money then. After that, groups of actors came more often. Will watched them build stages in the town square and hang thick bolts of fabric for backdrops. They pulled fancy costumes from their trunks. And presto! The play began. Young Will must have been spellbound. Sword fights, battles, love scenes. Tears and laughter. It was pure magic. Once, Queen Elizabeth visited a nearby castle. Will was eleven. There, actors dressed like knights and princesses. Others dressed like mermaids and imaginary beasts. They roamed the castle gardens or floated in boats on a pond. Still others performed on stages. Music drifted on the warm summer air, and fireworks dazzled the nighttime sky. The festivities went on for weeks. Good Queen Bess, 1533-1603 Queen Elizabeth I was good, indeed. In fact, many consider her one of England's greatest rulers. Born to Henry VII and in Bullen, Elizabeth was just two when her mother was beheaded for treason. Elizabeth was raised by servants far from her father's court. An amazing student, she studied philosophy, religion, and history. She could read and write in six different languages. Elizabeth came to the throne in 1558, at the age of 25. She never married, possibly so she wouldn't have to give up power to a husband. She had little interest in making war and had a genuine love for stage her people. Her peaceful rule set the stage for an era of exploration and scientific discovery, as well as the blossoming of literature, drama, and the fine arts. Good Queen Bess ruled for 44 years. Some people from Stratford were invited to see the plays at the castle. As a member of the town council, John Shakespeare was probably one of them. Perhaps he took young Will with him. One day, Will would be writing plays for the Queen himself. But that day was a long way off. It is likely that Will started school when he was five years old. The King's new school was on the top floor of the Stratford Town Hall. School days were long. Will rose before sunrise, ate breakfast, finished his chores, and walked to school. He was at his desk by six o'clock in the morning during the summer, seven o'clock in the winter. School ended at six o'clock in the evening. Classes were held six days a week, all year round. Will's only days off were Sundays, market days, and holidays. In Stratford, as in most of England, school was only for boys. Will learned to read from a horn book, a board with the letters of the alphabet and the Lord's Prayer printed on it. He also learned many other prayers. 
A year or two later, Will began to read Aesop's fables and Bible stories. He also read comic plays written a thousand years earlier. They were by a playwright named Plautus who lived in ancient Rome. Learning Latin was very important. Will began studying it when he was seven. Church services were held in Latin. Laws were written in Latin. As Will grew older, he and the other boys were not allowed to speak English at school. Only Latin. They were spanked if they spoke English. Will learned Latin grammar, he knew famous speeches in Latin by heart. He could write in Latin. Will also performed in plays and had debates with the other boys. He became good at it. He probably liked to be in front of a crowd. In Shakespeare's plays there are many lines about school. Most of them make school seem like a chore. In one play, As You Like It, he describes the whining schoolboy who is creeping like snail unwillingly to school. Does that mean Will didn't like school? Nobody knows. We never can be sure when William Shakespeare's characters are speaking for William Shakespeare, the man. We do know that Will learned a lot that he used later in his plays. The Bible story of Cain and Abel is mentioned 25 times in his work. He boarded funny stories from famous plays he liked, and sad stories, too. In Romeo and Juliet, two young people fall in love, but their families are enemies. So Romeo and Juliet get married in secret. But by the end of the play, both are dead. The plot of this play comes from Virgil. Virgil was a Roman poet who lived 1600 years before William Shakespeare was born. Was it considered cheating to borrow stories? Not at the time. This is what writers often did. What made Shakespeare's plays so great were the characters he created and the beautiful language he used. Will never went beyond grammar school. That's the reason some people don't believe he wrote the plays. How could he? They ask. A man with so little schooling? Some believe that Christopher Marlowe, a famous playwright of the same time, was really Shakespeare. Still others even suggest that Queen Elizabeth I or a nobleman the Earl of Oxford may have written the plays. But grammar school then was very different from elementary school now. By the time Will finished grammar school, he had studied many subjects taught in college today, such as philosophy, history, and great literature. When Will was thirteen, his family fell on hard times. The wool trade was England's largest industry. In the 1570s it collapsed. When the wool trade suffered, everyone suffered. Besides being a glover, Will's father was a moneylender. But when times got bad, many people who borrowed money could not pay it back. John was also a brogger. A brogger sold wool without a proper license. But John no longer made money from his wool business. To make matters worse, Will's father had borrowed money. He stopped going to church because he was afraid to run into people he owed. He stopped going to town council meetings. He sold his wife's land to pay debts. Will's father had risen quickly in the town of Stratford. He fell on hard times just as fast. There were six children in the Shakespeare family. Will was the oldest and expected to help out at home. We don't know what jobs he took after leaving school. But going on to a university wasn't possible. Money was too tight. Some historians believe that Will became an assistant teacher. Others think he was a clerk for a lawyer. Will may have been an apprentice in his father's leather business. Apprentices started doing the simplest jobs, like running errands. Training lasted for many years. But is anything known for sure? No. Not until Will turned 18. That's when William Shakespeare married and Hathaway. Chapter 2 Marriage and Children And Hathaway came from the village of Shottery. It was just a short walk across a cornfield from Stratford. And was one of seven children. 
Her family lived in a roomy cottage beside an apple orchard. No one knows how she and Will met. They were married on November 28, 1582, and was 26 years old. Will was only 18. He couldn't even apply for a marriage license by himself. His father had to sign the license as well. What made Will marry a woman so much older? Was he in love? These are more questions with no certain answers. One reason for the wedding may be that and was expecting a baby. The newlyweds moved into John and Mary Shakespeare's house on Henley Street. Their daughter Susanna was born six months later. Twins Hamnet and Judith came along a few years after that. The Shakespeare family was still struggling. It was a time of famine. Crops were poor. People went hungry all over England. All told, there were now eleven mouths to feed in the house. Soon after the twins were born, William Shakespeare left Stratford. His wife and children stayed behind. One story is that Will was kicked out of town for hunting rabbits on a neighbor's land. This story is not hard to believe. There was very little food to go around. Another story goes that Will may have joined a troop of actors that had come to Stratford. One of the actors was killed in a fight. So the company was short a man. Maybe Will took his place. This is also not a hard story to believe. We know that Will worked with many of the actors in this troupe later on in his career. Perhaps this was his best chance to make money for his family. Still others think Will may have left town for a very different reason. His cousin had been accused of plotting against the Queen. He was secretly a Catholic. In England, it was a dangerous time for Catholics. The Queen was the head of the Church of England. Catholics were viewed with suspicion. Will's cousin was sent to prison in London and put to death. Will may have also been a secret Catholic. After what happened to his cousin, perhaps he feared for his life. Did he go into hiding? Maybe. There is no way to know if any of these stories is true. They're just guesses. For the next seven years there is no account of Will. He seems to have disappeared. The years between 1585 and 1592 are called William Shakespeare's Lost Years. Chapter 3 Found Again Suddenly Will pops up again in 1592. Records tell us that by this time he was settled in London. Over 200,000 people lived in London in 1592. It was one of the greatest cities in Europe. People came to London in droves, mostly from the countryside but also from around the world. London was the center of trade and government in England. Will was 28 now. After a small town like Stratford, London must have been a shock. Huge brick and marble houses lined the banks of the Thames River. Behind them, many storied wooden houses jutted out into narrow lanes. They blocked out sunlight and fresh air. Chamber pots, used as toilets, were emptied from windows into the streets. They formed filthy streams of sewage that stank and made people sick. Rats scurried about carrying disease wherever they went. London was home to the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor. In good weather Queen Elizabeth sailed down the Thames, her beautiful barge a glitter with gold. Commoners like Will gathered on the river bank to catch a glimpse of the Queen. Her hair was as red as flames, her skin as white as chalk. And her gowns were made of the finest silks and brocades. Flutes, drums, and trumpets mingled with the sounds of laughter and the sparkle of sunlit jewels as she and members of her court sailed by. Crossing that very same river was London Bridge the bridge in the famous nursery rhyme. London Bridge was crowded with shops and narrow houses. The gates on either end were often decorated in a gruesome way. The rotting heads of dead traders were stuck on poles. Beware, these hideous heads seem to say. Go against the queen and you will pay the price. 
Beyond the bridge, ships rode the river's tide. Traders came to London from all over the world to buy and sell goods gold from Africa, silks and spices from Venice, tobacco from America, hand-painted wallpaper from China. Everything was for sale in London. As Will ate supper in crowded inns, he mingled with people from faraway places who had different ideas. Lectures were a popular London pastime. Will could hear explorers and scientists describe their travels and discoveries. And as he shared glasses of ale with soldiers in noisy taverns, he enjoyed tales of England's recent victory over Spain. Some people wonder how Will, son of a Stratford glove maker, could know so much about the world. In William Shakespeare's time, the world came to London. What Londoners considered entertainment would strike us as very strange. Bear baiting was quite popular in Shakespeare's London. It was a blood sport where bears and dogs fought each other to the death. Public hangings also drew big crowds. People shouted and cheered as the hangman slipped his noose around the necks of Queen Elizabeth's enemies. But nothing was quite as popular as the theater. Before Will's day, plays were performed in town halls, inns, and squares. There were no theaters. But in 1576, James Burbage did something different. He was an actor trained as a carpenter. He built the first theater, called Simply the Theater, just north of London. The word theater comes from theatron, which means seeing place in Latin. Burbage's wooden theater was a circular arena with an open roof. A giant stage sat in the center of the arena. It was surrounded by galleries on three sides. The galleries had a roof made of thatching bunches of straw tied together. The best tickets in the house cost sixpence, or six pennies. That bought a seat with a cushion, but the stage was far away. Wool was hardly a rich man. He probably paid about a penny for one of the cheapest tickets. He was allowed to stand with the other groundlings, or cheap ticket holders, closest to the stage. There, playgoers enjoyed snacks such as hazelnuts, oranges, and a drink called mead. They were also quick to toss other foods, like rotten fruit, at bad actors. Will knew it was a play day when a flag was raised outside the theater. Then he, and much of London, came running. The Lord Mayor of London did not support the theater. Theaters attracted big, noisy crowds that drank too much ale and spread diseases such as the plague. A crowded theater was also a tempting place for pickpockets. The Lord Mayor placed many restrictions on acting troops. There were rules for when and where they could perform. Not surprisingly, all the great theaters were built just beyond London's city limits. There, the Lord Mayor's rules didn't matter. He had no power. Burbage's theater was very successful. So another theater sprang up practically next door. It was called the Curtain. Several years later, the Rose was built just south of the Thames. And then a huge theater, called the Swan, was built near the Rose. The success of the new theaters was largely due to Queen Elizabeth. She loved plays. She often invited acting troops to perform at court. The Queen's love of the theatre made it a respectable pastime for all Londoners. A group of young playwrights, the University Wits, were all the rage in London. They wrote action-packed plays with ancient Greek and Roman settings. There were always lots of complicated plot twists. And the plays were written in a poetic new style. It was called blank verse. Blank verse doesn't rhyme, but it has rhythm. When you clap out a beat or play the drums, you create a rhythm. The rhythm, or pattern, of most blank verse has a fancy name, iambic pentameter. If you were to clap your hands to this rhythm, every other beat would be loud. Like this, da du um, da du um, da du um, da du um, da du um. This pattern repeats five times in each line of blank verse. Shakespeare used iambic pentameter to make his words flow as gracefully as notes of music. Christopher Marlowe was the greatest of the new playwrights at this time. 
He was born the same year as Will, and he came from the same kind of background. He Chris Topper Marlowe was the son of a shoemaker. But Marlowe had gone to Cambridge University. No doubt Will stood in the open courtyard of the Rose Theatre many times to watch Marlowe's plays. There he had the opportunity to learn much about poetry and playwriting. Later, Will wrote many of his plays in blank verse. He became a master of the style. Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare would have become great rivals in the world of theater. But Marlowe was a short-tempered fellow. He was killed in a tavern brawl in 1593 at the age of 29. Of course, Will couldn't just have fun, watching plays in London. He needed to earn a living. His first jobs in the theater probably had very little to do with acting or playwriting. Theatergoers needed someone to tend their horses. A popular story goes that Will took care of this. In fact, he was so good at the job, he soon hired boys to help him. Whether this story is true or not, for hundreds of years boys who held this job were known as Shakespeare's boys. Will may also have sold theater tickets. Or he may have been a prompter's assistant, helping actors with their lines during rehearsals. At some point, Will did begin to act. He had a lot of talent, but he must have started with small roles. Life in the theater was hard. It was also not considered a very respectable profession. Troops were small. There were only eight to twelve players in a troop. Will would have found himself playing several different roles in each play. All roles, even those of women, were performed by men. Every troop had a number of different plays they put on. In order to learn his parts, Will studied a scroll with just his lines on it. It was at this time that Will began to write. At first he probably added lines to other people's plays. He may have reworked old plays to make them seem new. Will also had a very nice